So Viasight is a uh, company based here in San Diego, and we're a relatively small company of 50 people. We are venture-backed, privately held, and have significant support from uh, nonprofit and government sources as well. Uh, we, as a small company, are focused on the development of a single product, and we are in preclinical stage right now. Uh, it's a very exciting time because we're on the, on the verge of submitting our IND, and hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to present uh, clinical data. So we have this single product for insulin-dependent diabetes, and the clinical evaluation should take place in 2014. Uh, the, co the combination product is called VC01, and this is a, essentially a cell uh, manufactured from embryonic stem cells. It's a pancreatic endoderm cell that is placed inside a macro encapsulation device, and that product, uh, once combined, is placed subcutaneously and uh, should actually replace the beta cells that are lost, as well as the endocrine, all the types of endocrine cells that are lost in uh, type 1 diabetes. So this is obviously a major commercial opportunity. The core aspects of this product are the use of human embryonic stem cells as the starting material for cell manufacturing. These cells are differentiated in the facility into pancreatic progenitor cells with the potential to become beta cells post-implant. So these are essentially an allograft and a prodrug, if you will, in that after implant they mature into glucose responsive insulin uh, secreting cells. The cells are called PEC01, and the device that we're working with uh, is being developed in house, and it's called Encaptra. So there's two remarkable properties of embryonic stem cells. I don't have to tell the people in this room that these cells have the ability to proliferate essentially indefinitely as well as the remarkable capacity to be turned into whatever cells in the body you'd like to make, provided you can figure out the recipe to do so. So uh, we have our own embryonic stem cell line, a proprietary line, Cythera 49. This is uh, essentially uh, ready to go for clinical testing. It's been made in uh, GMP compliant conditions, and we have GMP manufactured banks of this. With, because of the proliferative potential of human embryonic stem cells, we can make essentially from this one blastocyst derivation enough doses to treat everyone that needs this. This is an overview of how we make the pancreatic endoderm. So down below here, you can see this is a, an iteration of a protocol that was published in 2008, which is uh, turning embryonic stem cells into pancreatic endoderm through a stepwise differentiation process in the laboratory. And this took several scientists several years to develop this protocol. Uh, now we have uh, adapted the protocol to essentially scalable and industrializable um, manufacturing processes. It takes about two weeks, oops. Sorry, people. There we go. It takes about two weeks to expand from a vial to a 10 billion cell, cell stack. So we're currently manufacturing at the 10 billion cell uh, scale. These cells are harvested off the, the adherent cultures and put into suspension culture as cell aggregates. This differentiation process is now performed on ro cell aggregates in a rotational culture. After two weeks of this stepwise differentiation, these cells can be frozen, and each batch can be QC'd while it's in the freezer for the critical uh, aspects of the product. After the QC release occurs, this batch, uh, single vials can be thawed from the batch and recovered in culture. After that, we uh, load them into the devices and we'll be putting them into people eventually. So this is a, a schematic of the device. <clears throat> uh, this type of device has been in development in, for probably 20 years at other companies. But this is an opportunity now where this device had had trouble with eyelets 
as a, as a mode for carrying islets into people. Now with the progenitor cells, it seems to work much better. Islets are very demanding for uh, me metabolic demand and don't do well in the subcutaneous environment or in a hypoxic environment, whereas the progenitor cells actually do much better in that environment. Uh, this, oh, God. I gotta put my hand on the laser. Why is this not, there we go, okay. This is a uh, biocompatible polymer that this is made of um, medically, uh, medical grade um, plastics that have all been used in human products before. It's biostable and it both keeps cells in place and keeps cells out. So it has a semi-permeable membrane that allows the free flow of oxygen, nutrients, and importantly, glucose, as well as proteins such as insulin and other endocrine hormones. By having this uh, cell, uh, cell containment barrier, you both protect the cells from the immune system as well as keep the cells in a defined space in the patient. So this is just to illustrate what this looks like um, upon implant. So what happens upon implants is these cells find themselves in a hypoxic environment and immediately start making angiogenic factors to bring blood supply to themselves. And this is uh, pretty remarkable the way this works so that by um, four weeks, this uh, device has developed a thin fibrous capsule, which you'll be familiar with if you've worked with subcutaneous uh, implants. But within the fibrous capsule, so right up against the membrane, is the development of a full plexus of capillaries with its own dedicated uh, blood supply. Here you can see, uh, Histologically, this blood vessel right up against the membrane. So you can see there's uh, beautiful uh, endocrine pancreatic tissue in, inside the device, and then right up against the membrane is the blood supply. And here you can see by immunofluorescence, uh, three of the hormones, these um, essentially human islets that are created from embryonic stem cells express all of the five pancreatic endocrine hormones here we can see insulin is expressed in many of the cells, as well as uh, glucagon and somatostatin. By all uh, accounts that we've looked at these cells, such as uh, physiology, biochemistry, electron microscopy, the histology seen here, these are bona fide human islets. So just to walk you through um, how this uh, paradigm works in, in this animal uh, experiment, you can see here um, these, are, these are looking at, this is looking at mouse blood glucose, and you can see in two groups of mice, one which is given STZ to lesion their beta cells, and the other which is normal mouse, um, these mice are running at the mouse blood glucose level typical of mice, which is 150 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Upon STZ administration, these uh, animals become, frankly, hyperglycemic, mimicking diabetes. These animals are given insulin implants uh, periodically to keep them alive. At time zero here, you can see the uh, implant of the product, VCO1, and uh, trouble with the controller. There we go. So that uh, as these uh, insulin pellets dissolve, now the product is taking over uh, control of the animal's blood glucose. And uh, eventually, this is now driven in both populations, those with the lesion as well as normal mice, to the human blood glucose set point, which is closer to 100 milligrams per deciliter. This uh, product is stable in animals as long as we've been able to uh, look at it, which is essentially a year. We have to use immunocompromised uh, animals for these studies because the device does not protect from xenoimmunity, and these are human cells into animals. But, and so, consequently, these animals don't have long, li long lives, but uh, as long as we've looked at them, the animals, uh, the product maintains its function. 
Lastly, upon explant of the device, as you can see that both groups of mice return to their respective pre-implant blood glucose levels. This is really demonstrating that the device with the cells was controlling the blood glucose in these animals. Here you can see a, a glucose tolerance test. Uh, these animals are uh, either implanted with a predecessor device or the Encaptor device with cells, or it's just a normal mouse with no implant. And you can see that the uh, blood glucose uh, rapidly returns to uh, the pre-administration uh, level. As well, we don't see hypoglycemic overshoot. So we feel this is a relatively safe product that we can take into the clinic. I think the battery's dying on this. <laughs> okay. So here, uh, now that we're going to the clinic, we have to run uh, various GLP studies. This is just one example of a GLP study run at a CRO. Again, you can see here, uh, picking up these mice 20 weeks after implant, those that have cell-loaded devices are at the human set point. We used empty devices as controls in this study, and those mice are running at the, the mouse blood glucose set point. Upon administration of STZ in half of each group, you can see that the mice with the empty devices become hyperglycemic, and those with the cells in the device uh, maintain their, their normal blood glucose. Uh, this study also uh, was the first time we were able to look at uh, numerous um, other endpoints, and we really saw no safety issues with this product, looking at all these various typical uh, preclinical toxicology endpoints. So <clears throat> we had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA in uh, August of 2012, and that went well and we have agreement on what needs to be done to get the IND submitted successfully. Uh, we've been working all this year on, as well, uh, running the GLP safety studies that we wanted to do for the IND, as well as all the other quality control and process development uh, aspects of the product, to submit the IND in the first half of next year and launch this phase one, two trial. Uh, we've been supported by CIRM and JDRF, um, very substantially and are very appreciative of that. This product, as I mentioned, will be placed subcutaneously. We're thinking about where to put it. We're working with the um, plastic surgeon as well as transplant surgeons to develop the uh, methods that we will use in the clinical trial next year. One nice aspect of using the subcutaneous location is that we can monitor using ultrasound the product post-implant. There's obviously a concern with ES-derived products that you might get a teratoma. Uh, we've never seen teratoma with our product in the animal studies, but nevertheless, we need to have this uh, accounted for. And using ultrasound, you should be able to see a growth within the device should it occur, and then that device can be prophylactically removed if, uh, if you are concerned. Biocyte has a strong IP uh, portfolio that covers this space very well, uh, very much um, involved in embryonic stem cell methods, scalable methods for embryonic stem cell culture, as well as the endoderm pathway being strongly covered and the um, pancreatic endoderm and administration using such devices. So in summary, this uh, product, we believe, will meet patients' unmet needs, uh, both acutely on a day-to-day -day basis. Patients, should this work to its target product profile, patients will no longer need to be monitoring their blood glucose. The cells do that. They don't need to administer insulin. The cells do that. So cells are going to know how to do these things better than even the most diligent patient because cells will be maintaining the glycemic control. Patients will not have the... Uh, the excursions of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Consequently, we believe that this product could also reduce the long-term complications of type 1 diabetes that are significantly costly. So this should be a higher quality of life for patients um, and a potential to reduce the, the medical and healthcare costs of this disease substantially. 
lastly, I just wanted to thank uh, our various funding sources, JDRF and CIRM in particular have been tremendously supportive of this project. And uh, thank you for your time and listening to this.